Hello, my name is Diane Burns and I'm the Program Manager here at the Spina Bifida Coalition of Cincinnati. We're here with our fifth webinar in the Create Your Future series, Building Your Support Network. Jeremy Moses joins me here in the office as a co-facilitator and technical consultant. Hello everybody. I would now like to introduce our presenter, Tim Vogt. Tim is with the Starfire Council, a visionary organization working to build better lives for people with disabilities. The data is clear. People with disabilities grow increasingly lonely and isolated as adults. Working with one family and person at a time, Starfire connects people to relationships and uncovers a person's talents and passions so that they can thrive in their communities alongside their neighbors. Tim has spent 20 years as a passionate and committed advocate for full community inclusion for people with disabilities. Thanks, Tim, for sharing your experiences with us. Thank you, Diane, and uh, thank you, Jeremy, as well. I appreciate being here. Uh, one of the things that I always like to start with is just to tell you all how much it means to me. That's me at the bottom there. And I work at a place called Starfire here in Cincinnati. But it really means a lot to me to be able to talk to um, people that are in the struggle of inclusion and to kind of be there with you. You know, I think that we're all up against something very difficult. And um, that means that it goes easier on us when we have some company. So it's, it's nice to have company is what I'm saying. Uh, so the point of tonight is to kind of talk about relationships and friendships. And one of the things that I really love to think about around relationships is patterns. I think they're made up of patterns. Uh, there's ways to build relationships that have a certain feel to them. And uh, if you have a bunch of relationships, they create a pattern of, uh, of connectedness that helps you build a good life. So when I was thinking about what to call this, I really honed in on the word patterns. And I'd, I'd uh, invite you to think about that. A pattern repeats itself over and over again. A pattern can look very different. You think about a checkerboard or you think about a quilt or you think about some sort of, uh, of dress or, or, or some painting or something. You see these patterns repeated and um, they're very different all the time. There's patterns of time and patterns of space. So just can't kind of play with that word when you think about relationship. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, oh, first of all, this is super important. This is probably one of the most important things you'll hear on this whole webinar. And it's a heads up that relationships don't happen on a webinar. <laughs> Sometimes I think we get sucked into this idea that we can have these social relationships on social media. And we're all here, and literally I don't know who else is on uh, on the call, but Diane and, and Jeremy and I could actually meet up for drinks after this, which is pretty cool. But I've been on webinars where we're spread out across the country. And, and just remember, this is to get your information and get your ideas flowing and then to get out in the real world, right? Relationships only happen out there. So you haven't done anything by sitting on a webinar other than to collect your your ideas and your courage and your uh, best energies to get out there and do it. So uh, the first thing I'll start with is just to give you some background. This is pictures of Starfire when I first started working there. That's me up in the upper left-hand corner as Santa Claus. Uh, I was dressed for a dance for 150 people with disabilities. Um, I did a lot of those kinds of dances. Uh, I also, um, this is a picture of us at one of our uh, little parties that we used to have all the time. So you'll see big groups of people with disabilities. Um, we would have, that would be a Christmas dance or something like that. Here's a, another picture of a party, people dressed as uh, the village people. Uh, good people here, fun times, that was the best we could say of it. This was when we started Starfire University, so the idea was to try to create spaces for young people with disabilities to live uh, and grow beyond high school. And we really thought we were pretty awesome. Um, we thought that our ideas of having these fun outings and service projects and giving people options of where to go bowling or where to go out to eat was, was really great. 
and uh, it was always though the same pattern. So to go back to that word, it was groups of people with disabilities hanging out with each other. Maybe there was a staff or 10 that would be in charge of the outing or the dance or the program. And then they would be in a building or some sort of van or a group somewhere. So it was always group based. And that was the pattern. Groups of people with disabilities hanging out together. So our overarching question was around 2009, we really started to ask, what if there was a better story? And right here, I just want to stop and just offer that a um, couple things. One is, a, one is an assessment, uh, kind of thinking about, boy, does this mean that there was a bad story before? And then the second thing is an invitation to y'all. So the first thing is to ask, well, if we think there's a better story, sometimes people hear that and think that we think there's a bad story. Uh, I prefer to say, isn't it great that the people who started Starfire before I came had the courage to do so? Because they were helping people with disabilities jump out of institutions from the 50s and 60s, right? And the people that started the workshops and the group homes are no different. They helped start something that didn't exist and took a lot of courage to create. And so they handed us a legacy of courage. And then it kind of invites us then to say, wow, well, great job. And then it invites us to say, well, how, how are we going to carry that legacy on? And how are we going to hand off a better legacy to the next generation of families and of neighbors and of citizens and of workers in the field. So the, when I think about a better story, I just want to be real clear. I don't think that any of the things that we have currently are a bad story. I just think that there's better that we can do. I think there's more inclusion to happen. I think there's more, more uh, opportunities for people to live really full really great lives. Uh, the second thing is an invitation, and I'm inviting all of you into it as well. The funny thing is about this inclusion story, best I can tell, it doesn't just happen. Um, all of a sudden, I'm not going to wake up tomorrow and there's going to be a front headline on the Enquirer USA Today that says, uh, everybody wants to include people with disabilities, you know, headline news. It, it's going to actually take work. It's going to take people like ourselves um, and people like our allies kind of stepping into this new story and building a culture. So what I'm kind of inviting you into, whether you have a disability or have a uh, family member with a disability or, or work in the field of disability services, is to consider that you might have an opportunity to really reinvent the next generation of what inclusion looks like. So that kind of means, and this is where it gets kind of weird, it does mean that we have to let go of the old story. And for Starfire, we thought that since there was a better story possible and necessary, that it was okay to let go of the story of big dances and outings to the pumpkin patch and day programs full of 150 people with disabilities. Uh, and that was really hard. We were proud of ourselves. We won awards, we had grants, we had buildings, we raised $4 million, we were awesome, people loved us. I was like the executive director on high, everybody thought I was doing a great job. And then we said, uh-oh, we think there's a better story. So I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a background that since 2009, we've been on an, a journey as an organization to undo uh, um, groups of people with disabilities and the mindsets that create that reality. Uh, one of the um, things that, oh yeah, go ahead, Jeremy. I was just gonna say that you were you were mentioning people's uh, living situations, whether they're people with spine bifida or adults or caregivers. We have a poll on that, so uh, we'll go ahead and launch that right now. Uh, select the appropriate response on your screen and click submit. And we'll give you about 30 seconds or so to do that. We already have uh, we have 75% of the vote in already. That didn't take long at all, uh, and it's evenly split at the moment. Uh, we'll give you a few more seconds to uh, participate in that. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, we have the uh, full uh, 
complement of people voting, so uh, we'll go ahead and close it. The majority said that they are adults with spina bifida living outside of the family home. So there you go, Tim. Awesome. Appreciate that. Uh, cool. So uh, what we kind of ended up doing was there was this one night. I wanted to tell you guys these stories, and what this will also do is give you some people to kind of study up on and think about because – I think that one of the most important things, at least for me, is to pay attention to what people on the edges are saying. I was invited to hear a woman named Judith Snow speak, and she's the woman pictured here on the far right. She was in town speaker, speaking at Hebrew Union uh, Institute up there by a Good Sam in Cincinnati. She was being introduced that night by a man named John McKnight, who is here in the middle, and he was being introduced by Peter Block, who actually lives here in Cincinnati. I got inter in invited to this evening. I had no idea what was going to happen. This was 2009. But it literally changed the trajectory of my life and my work. Uh, Peter started off the night, and he says, uh, Cincinnati has an old story. He said, we are more than Pete Rose and Marge Schott and race riots. And this was 2009, so at the time it kind of felt like uh, he was crazy, you know, that we, we were just those stories. He said, we are a bunch of great people with great stories, and we need to tell all those beautiful stories to tell the true story of Cincinnati. After he got up, John McKnight was, was, uh, was presenting, and he said this really provocative thing. He said, my heart is bad. He said, and it's worth about a half a million dollars to the hospitals in Chicago where I'm from. He said, but it's not worth anything to my family and to my neighborhood. He said, actually, it, it, it's a problem for them, my bad heart. And he said, I want you all to think about that and beware of businesses who profit off of other people's problems. And in that moment, what he was doing <laughs> was calling out all of the nonprofits and the governmental agencies centered around disability services. It was like a knife to my heart. I was like, I think this guy's talking about me. And I was super angry with him for saying all of this, by the way. Uh, but something really resonated with that. And then Judith got up there. And uh, Judith, if you had ever known, uh, I don't know if how many people know her, but worldwide uh, speaker and traveler, uh, author, artist, and also was uh, quadriplegic. And she gets up there and she says, there's no such thing as disability. She says, the only thing that matters is what gifts you bring and how those get to show up in the world. So I was kind of like, who are these hippies and what the heck is their problem? But one of the things that it really did was, was it really interrupted the narrative that we had built around the idea that disability was a real thing that mattered, and if we focused on it, we could provide enough services to help people get ahead. And what they were asking us was, well, what are the gifts that those people offer? And instead of, instead of serving those kinds of gifts, why don't you try to figure out how to, uh, instead of servicing people's problems, why don't you figure out how to show their gifts and help them share those with other people in the community. So it's really just a provocative evening and I wanted to share with you these three books are something that you can order on Amazon and really read up. The Careless Society by John McKnight, The Abundant Community by Peter and John, and then um, Behind the Piano by Judith Snow. And uh, the companion book, uh, sorry, Behind the Pianos by Jack Pierpoint about Judith Snow, and then the companion book by Judith Snow, What's Really Worth Doing and How to Do It. Uh, brilliant stuff, and uh, anybody that's interested in inclusion should take a look at that stuff. So uh, when Peter and John wrote Abundant Community, they actually reached out to me and asked me if I'd be interested in learning about that book. I said, sure. I was super interested. I had gotten over my anger at them for disturbing my nice, calm, peaceful, successful nonprofit profiteer role. Um, and they asked me to go out and interview my own neighbors. And it was really fascinating because I had already kind of started down the road of thinking about relationships for people with disabilities, but I had not thought about my own relationships. And that's where it went from 
mildly disruptive to completely crazy. I started to really think about the fact that on my own block I only knew two people. I had told a story for eight years about those people on my block that didn't talk to me or that I didn't know, and I had told the story that they were just a bunch of jerks who never made me cookies and never helped me move in and didn't talk to me. And as I was complaining about this to my wife, Bridget, she looked at me and I looked at her and we said, oh my gosh, we haven't baked anybody cookies. We haven't talked to anybody on this block. We haven't been the kind of welcomers and the people that create the culture that uh, would be the kind of culture that we're looking for in relationships. So we were really super aware of our own lack of relationships and we started to talk to some of our friends about that and what we discovered was that it's kind of a modern day American problem that we have kind of retreated into our living rooms with our Netflix and our uh, backyards and our kind of privacy and we have lost this sense of neighborhood and of connectedness and of conversation and, uh, and, and friendship. We really have become very much more isolated. And that is overlaid on top of the story of disability, which uh, a lot of research shows is an isolating experience. So right away, we were really confronted with, well, how are we going to help people find relationships if we don't know how to do them ourselves? And Peter and John kind of introduced us to some of the ideas that they had. They said, start with one person and start interviewing people about what they want to see in the neighborhood. They flipped it right away from what we wanted to see happen to us listening to other people and connecting them so that they could see what happened. So I want to tell you a story about that. The first one uh, that I want to tell you about is that's my wife, Bridget, in a striped shirt. That's my son, Patrick, in front of her, and our friend, Walter, in front of, front of him. We live here in Bellevue, Kentucky, and behind them is the very start of the Bellevue Community Garden. When I first started this little interviewing project, what I did was I interviewed my wife because I was too scared to go interview the neighbors that I hadn't talked to yet. And one of the things I discovered about my wife, which is totally a terrible thing to say after you had already been married seven years at the time, was that she wanted a community garden. She wanted to get more involved with gardening, and uh, she wanted me to figure out you know, if there was anybody else out there that liked that. My second interview was with the woman here in the middle, Christine. She lived a couple blocks over from us, but I knew her from my days in a rock and roll band. Uh, she tended bar at the Southgate house. And uh, I was interviewing her about her interests in the neighborhood. And at the end of it, she said, you know, I love art and I love teaching, but I really want to see an orchard where people can pick their own food. And I said, oh, that's interesting. That's what Bridget wants to do too. My third interview was with this guy, Steve Brunn, who's a council member here in Bellevue, Kentucky. And he's into Republican politics and guitar playing, and uh, he's an IT expert. And uh, he's, uh, he and I don't talk much about the politics, and um, I don't know how to play any guitar, and IT is a mystery to me. But as I was telling him the story about Christine and Bridget, he said, well, I'm on council, and there's tons of little spaces of of land that you could ask council to use for a garden. He says, I think this is a wonderful idea. Let me help. So he introduced us to Tom Wheathorn, the former mayor. And Tom introduced us to all of the ladies who were involved in the neighborhood association and the gardening team. And before you knew it, we had about six or seven people that were interested in starting a community garden, all just from asking questions, which we thought was pretty cool. Uh, the last person that got involved is Mitch, this young man on the right. His mom had called Starfire asking if she could get her son with Down syndrome connected to our programs. At the time, I asked her where she lived and she said Bellevue. I said, how about instead we get coffee? <laughs> and so Mitch and, and his mother Cindy and I had coffee the next day and it turned out that Mitch had a big interest in working in his neighbor's garden. And so Mitch and Bridget and Christine all got together with Debbie and Tom and a few others and they went to a class at the Civic Garden Center. Mitch ended up knowing the guy who was funding local community gardens as a former neighbor. He gave him $1,000 and they started the Bellevue Community Garden, Blossom Alley. And you'll see a little picture down there of some kids uh, hauling dirt and, and dumping in that first load of dirt. 
over here, what you'll see is we've run this garden now for seven years. Uh, up in the left is Annabella from school who came down. We take a class of the grade school students down there to learn. Uh, a lot of them didn't know carrots grew underground. At the bottom there is uh, Kirk who lives right next to the garden. His wife, Christine, helped start it with Bridget cutting up one of the watermelons. We hand out free food. We leave it on the table there and anybody from the neighborhood can grab it. Uh, you'll see corn parties and up at the top, Bridget working with the kids. In this picture, right now in all these pictures, there are one, two, three, four, four children on IEPs. And it's important to notice that we try to create a space in our neighborhood where everyone is welcome adults and kids, kids on an IEP, kids without disabilities, and there's space for them to learn and to participate. And over the last seven years, there's probably been about 25 families total in and out of this project. We hold it every Wednesday and every uh, Sunday during planting season, April to October. Wow, uh, that's quite an impressive, uh, that's quite an impressive deal. And for me, uh, a prime example of expanding my network a little bit uh, happened when I started getting involved in uh, bus issues, transportation issues. Uh, you know, I I found like-minded citizens, uh, both with and without disabilities, who very much want to see uh, transit expand in the uh, in the region. So, you know. Growing your support net network is, at, you know, that that's that's the key thing is you got to find similar interests. Yeah, I agree, Jeremy. And what the interesting thing to me is that you end up with this gift to yourself. That, but if you start by saying, uh, let's just imagine we had a bullhorn that everybody in Cincinnati could listen to, and we said, hey, everybody, who wants to be my friend? Right? Like, one, that doesn't make any sense as an invitation. No. But if we start with who wants to start a garden in Bellevue or who wants to rally around transportation in Cincinnati, you get some hands raised, right? Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting. You actually have to start with a question or an invitation so that people can jump in into something outside of themselves. There's actually some really great research that says if you want to cross over a diversity barrier, okay, if you want people to build a relationship across a diversity barrier, and disabled and non-disabled would be one of those barriers, black and white would be one of those bar barriers, Muslim and Christian would be one of, right, those kind of barriers. If you want to get over that, the way to do it is not to have people sit down and have coffee with each other and talk. The way is for them to work on a project together. This is why companies have project days, and this is why schools have kickoff projects, and this is why sororities and fraternities have these you know, special bonding days. They want their members to get to know each other by painting the playground together or by building a little you know, flower garden or something. So projects like yours, and transportation advocacy and ours building a garden draw people together closer than if we just sat them in a room and made them t tell each other their life story. So I think it's really Absolutely. interesting. What that led into was a group of families started a PTO. Uh, some people decided that garden wasn't their thing, but they wanted to start a PTO. A group of families decided they wanted to start the Little Free Libraries. We now have 17 of them in, around the city of Bellevue, which is only a square mile. Uh, a bunch of people decided to start potlucks, and so every fourth Sunday in Bellevue, there's a potluck with roughly 15 to 20 families that show up, and everybody brings food, and that's been going on for now four and a half years. So what you're starting to see, if you remember at the beginning of the presentation, I said, this is about patterns of relationships, and what you see is this pattern of Wednesday and Sunday at the garden. And this pattern of every month at the PTO meeting, and this pattern of every month at the community uh, potluck, and you'll see the spatial pattern. 17 little free libraries dabbled about the city where people share books and, and donate books and, and trade books. You'll see this pattern of uh, PTO meetings at the school and, uh, and potlucks at the community center and gardens at the corner of Center and Foot Avenue, right? So 
you see these patterns start to spring up. And lastly, what you'll notice in these patterns is time. Relationships take time. There's a great, great quote from Plato that says, men grow uh, friendships by eating a pound of salt together. And what he means is not you sit down and just chow down on a mound of salt that would kill you. It means that over the course of a lifetime, you would have eaten a pound of salt together. So that's three important things to remember. It's about space and local. It's about, uh, and passion, what you're talking, Jeremy, it's about, um, it's about an interest and uh, time, getting together over and over again, and, uh, and, and routine, making that happen again and again and again, right? So right. Uh, you'll see here front yard movie nights we started, again, to create a new pattern. Every other third Friday in the summer times, we throw out a projector and we have a front yard movie night, a derby party every year. Uh, we now have four block parties in Bellevue. This is a picture of one, but we have four of them. We started with one. Uh, one's actually an alley block party, which is interesting. Uh, one neighbor decided to have two night bourbon and cigar nights for all the, the men and their sons. So there's lots of ways for people to create patterns in neighborhoods that draw people together again over time. Again, in this picture here, there are one, two, three, four, five children that, that uh, would be on an IEP. So there's ways to build inclusion um, that, that look more like neighborhood than they do look like some sort of, you know, buddy, buddy system or something. So when we started to think about our own lives, we started to ask the question, well, what if there is a better story? And we had to now bring that story that I just showed you, what we've learned in Bellevue in our own lives. And a lot of our staff took this on. Some staff did it in Madisonville, and some staff did it in Northside, and some other staff have done it in Covington. So if there is a better story, then what do we do around our work if we cross that river over into Cincinnati, right? So the first thing that I really wanted to kind of hammer home, and Diane pointed to this as well, is we decided in 2010 when we were undoing Starfire, we wanted to get a better starting point. Our old starting point was a set of really bad assumptions. It was an assumption that all people with disabilities like to be around each other. It was assumptions that that's as best as they can do. And it was a set of assumptions that we were the be all end all of experiences. And what we decided instead was to use a framework by John O'Brien called the Five Valued Experiences. And you can actually, at the end of this, we've got, oh, down here in the handout section, we've got a list of resources that you can print off and have. And you can, it lists some of the, the mentors, for lack of a better word, that we have uh, borrowed from over the course of our journey. And those same people would be people that you can reach out to and talk to and email and go visit and buy coffee and that's, that kind of stuff. But John says there's five real things that we should be thinking about when we think about inclusion and relationships. One is, is that it, it's better when we are uh, constantly in shared places not special places. So Starfire's building is not where inclusion lives, right? And he also said we have to be able to experience the respect and be treated with our greatest, greatest attributes. Remember in Judith say it's about gifts, not problems. So we think that focusing on people's deficits or problems is pretty disrespectful. In hindsight, we think there's a better way just to name the gift and treat people accordingly. John says that we need to be able to help people and contribute to the world and be a giver. So you'll see in all of our stories, people are contributing by offering, hey, I'd like to start the potluck. I'd like to be a part of the garden. I'd like to help out with the little free libraries. Uh, people get to make choices. Uh, Jeremy said, I'm, I just got uh, interested in transportation. That was a choice he made based on what he was interested in. He didn't want to start a garden. Right, And that's what's interesting is that uh, you don't have to focus on what Tim says to do. You, you start to listen to what's, what's wanting to be born in my neighborhood. How do I be a part of that? And if it's something stupid that I'm not interested in, like, I don't know, um, I could care less, honestly, about soccer. But everybody in Cincinnati loves FC Cincinnati. So if somebody wanted to start an FC Cincinnati watch, watch club, I'd say that's awesome. 
but I really want to be a part of it, right? So it's just interesting how we choose, how we participate. And then lastly, that we get to grow in relationships while we're there and diverse relationships, not just ones that Starfire was defining based on disability. So we just encourage you all to get a better starting point and look at something like this as maybe a framework. Um, we had some really nice ways to start that John and Peter had taught us. One is explore yourself. Try as many things as possible. Get out into your community and talk to your neighbors. What are they doing with their time? What are they interested in? Um, network around you, what you discover. So once we discovered that gardening might be a thing, my question wasn't just what are you interested in in Bellevue. It became even more specific. Who do you know who's interested in gardening? And that's when Tom says, oh, the ladies from the Bellevue Neighborhood Association, they're going to love this. And they did, right? And then when we went to the Civic Garden Center, we say, if anybody comes over here from Bellevue, send them our way. And when we go down to, there's a florist, and there's a, a bunch of different uh, plant shops you know, around. And we go and we say, hey, do you know anybody from Bellevue that shops here? Uh, create something new. This isn't the only way. You could also build on something that exists. But try to figure out how to bring some imagination into the world. We look around and say it's pretty boring. We're all waiting around for somebody else to do it. So it's going to be on us to have to really create something new. And then after that, deepen and strengthen. So you'll just see those patterns that we just looked at. And I want you to hold these four things as we look forward into these next few stories. So remember in the abundant community, and uh, I'll just give you a quick little helpful hint on there. This is something you can also see on the list of resources. Uh, Peter and John offer that you should be asking people about their talents, their interests, their passions, and their skills, tips. So as I went out and interviewed neighbors, I had this in the back of my mind. They say this is the gifts of the head, the hand, and the heart, that listening to people is the greatest way to start relationships. And I, I would really encourage you all to think about becoming a real listener in your neighborhood as a way of getting more relationships in your own life. And you know what? Along those same lines, uh, the question just came in, uh, who's your first point of contact asking the questions of what's going on in your neighborhood? That's so who could great, that be? That's a great question. So let's start with that question, and then we're going to go into this list too, which is related to that. You probably want to ask a version of that question. You want to start with the question, who knows everyone in this neighborhood? And you're going to have a real clue to that because they're already going to be in leadership positions. In our neighborhood in Bellevue, you want to look at city councilmen, right, and councilwomen. You want to look at coaches, like head coaches of, of, uh, of schools, local schools. They usually always know somebody. A lot of people, principals do as well. Uh, a lot of pastors. And if you can get five or six pastors from a community in one room, I guarantee you, you can almost connect with almost every single family in that city, right? So uh, you start with thinking about who knows everybody here, and you can usually find those people pretty quickly. It's interesting to me to find the people that are kind of under the radar, though, and for if you were in my neighborhood, I'd point you to a guy named Mike because he walks the neighborhood every day, retired as the local butcher a few years ago. I'd also point you to Casey, who still works at Kroger. Casey talks to everybody. I mean, I think Kroger pays him to talk to people because we all love going in there because Casey <laughs> always tells us everything. If you go to Roger the barber, he knows the gossip of every guy in the community, right? So he's just like hot on what's going on in the city. And then you've got like your coffee barista, Christine at Avenue Brew is always telling me everything that's going on. So it's really interesting to find these people and you just notice who's chatty, you know. But the key is, is to start with one. Notice that I started with Bridget. I was a little afraid, like, oh my gosh, I don't know anybody in Bellevue. What am I going to do, you know. Instead of just letting that stop me, I said, well, I do know Bridget. I'm married to her, so it's kind of cheating, but that's okay. So what I would encourage you to do is think about who around me could I interview just to practice and start in close. Who do I know that it's not too risky, right? And what you want to do is go from there and say, who else should I talk to? That's when I talked to Steve. He said, you should talk to Tom. And then Tom said, well, you should talk to these people. And he gave me a whole list of people, right? So Tom was the super connector in that story, and he knew everybody in Bellevue because he was the mayor. But uh, everybody knew someone else to ask. 
the other thing is to let it emerge. You don't want to go in and say, I'm going to start a transportation advocacy group in Bellevue because I care about transportation. You're going to want to say, hmm, I wonder what people are thinking about doing in Bellevue and if there's any energy around it. And if transportation advocacy pops up, well, then go for it. You could probably gin the game here, uh, Jeremy, if you wanted, by looking at the people who are riding red bikes and finding the kids that are building the skate park down in Newport. Those yeah. are the people that would be your people, you know, and you could start there and they'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm on board for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, you know what? We have another poll that we we could go ahead and – launch about uh, who, peop who people currently have in their support network. So we'll go ahead and we will launch that right now. Uh, you can select all that apply there and uh, we'll uh, give you about, I'd say we'll give you about 30 seconds as we usually do. And, and while we're talking about that, you know, that was the key for me was I had to find um, somebody that, uh, I had to find people that we're looking into the same things that I was, and we're like, huh, why aren't more people talking about this? And then come to find out there were already people that were organizing, and I was like, I need to be involved with this. <laughs> <laughs> and they were probably like, where are all the other people that should be involved in this? So they were looking for you too, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, we have, uh, we have everybody's vote in. Uh, looks like it's a tie. 75% uh, say that they have a spouse and or par or partner, and 75% uh, also say they have non-disabled peers and friends, and then 25% uh, uh, with uh, professionals who help with personal care transportation, and then 50% say others with spina bifida or another disability and or parents slash siblings. Tim? Cool. Well, um I love the fact that those those were all included. Uh, I would point out, at least I, I think, that all relationships are valid. Um, sometimes people mistakenly think that we're about just uh, non-people uh, without disability uh, being in people with disabilities' lives. Uh, I just am mostly concerned with the circumstances that force people into only relationships with other people with disabilities. So uh, I, I'm just like kind of the counter voice to what I consider to be a pretty pervasive culture around uh, people with disabilities just being given the option to hang out with each other. So it, it's not that uh, we should be, we should have a nice diverse, uh, diverse network in every single sense of the word. Um, so just to continue on with this little uh, list here, deep is okay. It's it's really okay to get deep. I remember interviewing an artist here in Bellevue, and she was leaving, and I said, hey, by the way, nice conversation about your art. How did you move to Bellevue? And she told me a story of having left her abusive boyfriend. And mm -hmm. what I understood then was that I said, well, could do you think you could ever teach other young people how to stay out of abusive relationships? And she said, sure. And that was really interesting was to think about what if the gifts that we have to offer are things that are a little bit, uh, I don't know, maybe we're ashamed of or that we're worried about telling. So I, I would really encourage as you guys get out there and think about people that have uh, something to offer, people that you might help start some interesting things with. There might be stories out there that start with some hurt, and that's okay. Uh, and lastly, I just encourage people to appreciate the heck out of each other. So if you do end up talking to your neighbors and listening to them, you know, just say thank you. You've got an amazing story. That's what everybody wants to hear, by the way. So that's just a little quick overview of neighborhood interviewing. Um, here are some sample questions. Where is your favorite place in, in this city or community? What would you teach children? Why does that matter to you? That helps you get deeper. Uh, where does this connect? Where are other people connected to this? And where does this cross over? So you might say, well, where does transportation and gardening cross over? Right? And all of a sudden we've invented a bus with a rooftop garden or something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, where, and my favorite question, what were you born to do? And I think we're always on that journey. So uh, it's just important, if you could, just use these as some simple questions. This is being recorded. You can come back to it. But it was my favorite ones to get conversation going. Um, I wanted to tell a few stories just to show you some examples of the diversity of projects that we help people with disabilities start over at Starfire. 
Uh, this is uh, Michelle, who was by herself writing Harry Potter fan fiction. And at some point, we hooked her up with the women writing for a change. We discovered there was a women's writing group. And all of a sudden, Michelle and these women started a project where they were dropping off uh, diaries to local cafes with prompts. And it would say, tell us about your first love, or tell us a secret that you haven't told anybody else, or uh, when was a time when your heart was broken? And they would leave this thing in the cafe for a couple weeks, and then they'd all go to the various cafes and pick them up, and they'd bring them together and they read them. It was like Cincinnati was keeping a diary. That now has been happening every other week at, at, at Rose Street Cafe for four years. So Michelle went from having outings with just people with disabilities and writing by herself to now, this is a picture from this year, and that picture previously was from 2013. She now writes with these writers every other week. And it's important to notice that these people would be what we call relationships, right? These are people that have known Michelle for a long time. And it grew out of an invitation for her to create a space with people that cared about the same things she cared about, very much like my community garden and like Jeremy's transportation advocacy group. One of the pictures that I've been thinking about lately is this one over here, I actually drew that. And I think of sometimes we have all these different aspects of ourselves. Some of our circle is about disability and some is about gardening and some is about uh, being a Republican or a Democrat and some is about being a Catholic or a Jewish person. And uh, what, what I'm interested in is these spaces that are colored in. Um, how does our life cross over with others? So if me and somebody who's Jewish have a shared passion in, in writing, that's really great. If me and somebody who's got a disability have a shared passion in gardening, that's really great. So really start to think about how and where the vibrant places are that your life crosses over with other people's lives and not just the story of disability, right? Um, just been really interested in that, especially as Michelle talks or Michelle's story comes up. Uh, one thing that's important is that it can be anything. This is Nick over here and Nick is interested in dreaming and lucid dreaming and metaphysics. So he had a he had a uh, film screening about dreaming. He had a dream interpretation call-in night. He actually is still connected with the metaphysics school of Cincinnati. And uh, that's been about four years as well. Uh, Andy started, uh, well, he actually didn't start it, but he joined a Beatles fan club. Um, and he started actually a fundraiser for that fan club down at Japs and, and over the Rhine. And uh, and just has been uh, a real blessing to his life, this story of music instead of the story of disability. And then Margot started a storytelling uh, slam night at, um, at uh, Awakenings in Hyde Park. And, and the key to this is that Margot's not writing Harry Potter fan fiction. She's not writing with women writing for a change. She's not a part of the Beatles boosters. It's everybody's individual choices, right? And we held it at Awakenings because that was close to where Margot lives. And, um, and, and so it's important to remember John's five valid experiences, shared place, choice, respect, and relationship. Um, this is Candace, who lives in Westwood and works now at, uh, at uh, the Dress for Success over there in her neighborhood. That's Megan with Candace on the left in 2014. That's Megan with Candace on the, on the right in 2017. So Megan and Candace still are in each other's lives over the course of three years. At the bottom, Candace has now grown into a project called Warrior Moms, which helps single mothers have free makeovers. And that sprung out of Candace's love and experience in dress for success around makeup and fashion. So to me, it's really been important that we invest in other people's passions too. Uh, the person that started dress for, or sorry, uh, started Warrior Moms is Nicole Lee, and Candace helped her with that project. So if Candace can be a giver and get involved instead of just inventing her own, she has a chance to really uh, grow her own network that way, right? Um, 
This is Michael, who is somewhat internet famous now because he brewed beer with the Mad Tree guys, Kenny and uh, a bunch of those guys over there, <laughs> and they ended up hiring him. So he works there on uh, Fridays, Thursdays and Fridays, and he actually works at 50 West, the other brewery out in um, out in uh, Toward Anderson in, in Newtown. He works there on uh, on Wednesdays. So Michael has this whole beer life. And what's interesting about that is that it just popped up and we had no clue that beer brewing was going to be a part of his story. And so we would really encourage you all to leave room for new people and for old friendships to evolve. Jim and Evan at the top there are friends of Michael. They love beer brewing. But their relationships with Michael have grown. Jim now helps Michael. They go and watch NFL games on Sunday. They don't just drink beer together, right? So one of the keys has been to allow weird opportunities to spring up. And this is Doug, who works down at the Contemporary Arts Center, and those are two of his colleagues there. Uh, some of these passions turn into jobs, and Doug's uh, creative idea was, what if I put a GoPro on my on my electric wheelchair and his electric wheelchair then acts as a tripod and he collects footage for the CAC's uh, behind the scenes videos that go out and then his colleagues Josh and I forget the other gentleman's name help edit that footage with him in the marketing department so it's really critical that we start to develop these kinds of relationships and we base them out of assets that we have we have a nice steady tripod of a wheelchair we have an interest in the arts we have an interest in beer we have a network of people who own breweries now you know we we have a lot of opportunities so a couple hints for you as we approach kind of the first uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a few more hints for relationships and then we'll open it up to questions but the first thing I'd invite you to think about is how do we actually create this inclusive culture with patterns of space and time so remember back at the beginning I said this is about patterns and then later on I said this is an invitation 2017 here we are is kind of the end of I think congregated segregated experiences for people with disabilities and what we need instead to replace that is an inclusive culture where all people mutually support and uh, challenge each other and take care of each other and look out for each other and then grow in relationships that's only going to happen if we the people on this uh, on this uh, webinar actually promote that kind of culture okay. you know what uh, real quick uh, we'd like to uh, ask people uh, to uh, tell us in the question pane uh, how have you reached out to your own neighborhoods to commu to create relationships uh, and you can do that in the question pane, and we'll uh, collect those responses and uh, look into them. That's awesome. Uh, and while I'm thinking about it, uh, we have one more poll that I'd definitely like to get in here. Uh, we'd like to know how many people that uh, our attendees think they should have in their support network. One or two, three to five, six to ten, eleven to twenty, or more than twenty. So we'll go ahead and launch that right now, and we'll give you about thirty seconds. Oh, this is going to be interesting. I hope they don't pick the wrong answer. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. We'll There's no wrong. There, there isn't a wrong answer. You're right. Uh, we've already got about 75%, and it's evenly split between uh, – well, <laughs> there we go. It's evenly split, but nobody says one, one or two. Everyone thinks that it should be at least three, and uh, – uh, more, more than 20 is also up there, so we'll go ahead and close that. And Tim, back to you. Well, I, I, I do think that that question is interesting. Whatever you're comfortable with is where you should start. However, as you'll see later on, I'm a big proponent of having as big a network as possible just because what I know about networks, at least my own and many of that I pay attention to, they are fragile. People enter your life and leave your life in a lot of different ways. So I really believe in big, robust networks that can kind of uh, morph and change over time. Does that make sense, Jeremy? I agree. It, it does make sense. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, relationships definitely need to be able to evolve, as you said before. Yeah. 
so one of the things that we want to think about is how do we, as people with disabilities, supporters, family, and, and allies, how do we actually create culture? And I, and I think that a world full of transportation for everyone, uh, locally sourced vegetables, uh, interesting writing circles, home brew beers, and uh, and, and, and fashionable ladies is way more interesting than a world that just has a bunch of programs and nonprofit services. So I'm really interested in what we do with our lives that isn't just about disability services. And I think that that's actually what the call, times call for. Um, one of the things that I'd encourage you guys to use when you're thinking about how to start creating projects and experiences that can draw people into your network is to be creative and really try to create a sense of vibrancy in your neighborhoods. Look at this space. We've taken over streets, front yards, living rooms, and sheds, right? We've literally said the community belongs to us. Our relationships are on display here. It's not hidden away where we only have these relationships when we're at the bar, right? And it sure as heck isn't on a Facebook page, right? So. It's important to think about how do you really create vibrancy and conviviality around uh, around these spaces that we share every day. It just has a way of igniting neighborhood. I'll tell you, last year we put a front yard uh, fire pit in our front yard, and we have more neighbors stop and hang out with us around that fire <laughs> than we we can handle some nights. You know, so just think about ways that you uh, build out that space, and then. Plant seeds that will grow, nurture them over the years. A relationship is something that actually takes tending. It means you ask the question, how did we become friends over 40 years? Well, we would have had to be friends over 39 and 38 and 37 and all the way back. And we would have to say, well, we planted that first seed when I said hello. And when I showed up to the potluck and we both brought the same thing and your recipe was better than mine and you gave me the recipe. Or the time you know you lost your spouse and I was there for you. Or the time um, you know we went to that meeting to uh, really yell at John Cranley about cutting streetcar funding or something. You know, <laughs> those are the times that we keep building into each other. And so it's important that we plant a lot of seeds because they're not all going to grow. And then we nurture the ones that do. If that makes sense. That does make sense. A couple helpful hints, I think, uh, just to kind of close out my section again before we um, we open it up for questions. Um, one, I don't like to think in plurals. Uh, I don't like to think of them and those people. I think that gets us stuck. Uh, if you say, how do I have a bunch of friends, I would say that's an impossible question. Say, how would you grow one friendship? Well, let's figure out who it is that you're interested in, and let's start from there. Where would we want to show up to find that person? Once we find that person, how would we build into them? Send them birthday cards and call them when they uh, are miss a meeting or something, right? But if we try to think about how do we make friends, it's almost too big. You have to get super, super, super specific and say, how do I meet more people on my block? How do I connect with people at my work, you know? And I'm happy to help anybody, by the way, think on those questions. Just let me know. Uh, I don't like to think about hypotheticals a lot. Uh, the reason being is they end up shutting down possibility before it ever happens. Uh, good case in point would be the community garden. When we first started talking about it, there was one group, in, one couple in particular, that was really worried that the soil would have uh, poison or lead or coal in it or something. And they would not let it die. Every meeting we had, we would say, well, we're going to get the soil tested. We just haven't done it yet. We don't need to be talking about this until we get that soil tested. And it was just funny. They thought that the point was actually to have a garden. And we knew that the point was actually to be together, right? And so if you get worried about what's not going to work or if it's going to rain or all that stuff, you never get started. And the same thing goes, especially around disability. There's a lot of fear. Well, what if I reach out and the person I reached out to murders me? 
Well, yeah, that's a great question, but it doesn't really happen that often, right? <laughs> and if you know people safely, meaning you're not going over to Craigslist strangers' house the first time you've ever met, well then it's okay. <laughs> maybe you're just waving to them on the sidewalk as you walk by their house because they live next to you, or maybe you're just saying hi when you see that they have a cup of tea down at the cafe. Right, so there's ways that we can plan for safety and not get stuck in hypotheticals. Uh, the last thing I'd like to point out just in this helpful hints is support does not equal segregation. Some people say, well, I still need support, and I say, yeah, that's true, but the system should provide that without segregating people. So if you're ever forced to only be with people with disabilities or that's your only option, that's a pr pretty good hint that, that there might be something better out there. Uh, I see a little comment over here that somebody took a garden class and met a man who introduced uh, introduced him to a community supported farm and now meet new people who like to garden and eat organically each week. Yeah, exactly. Like you take a class, right? And all of a sudden somebody introduces you to the farm, you get involved, and now you've got all these people who enjoy the same things, right? Start a, start a recipe swap. Um, my garlic was really great this year, so I'm going to give it out to everybody, you know, like that's a way to really get uh, cred in the community garden world. It's, it's like you have your like all-stars, they could have their own baseball cards, they're so good at it. So that's a really great observation. Yeah, um, and you know, uh, you brought up the whole safety point. Uh, we have a question here that everyone is on dating sites, meeting people online these days. How do I safely meet someone in person that I've met online and determine whether they're trustworthy, even uh, if, if, we're, if we're not going to deal in hypotheticals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's a tough one, right, because it gets back to that plurals. Uh, we'd have to think super specifically. Um, right. I, I'm just a big fan of local, 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 local. I know people are using the internet to date more and to find each other. Um, I'm, just, I'm just not in that world. Uh, I'd be a big believer in churches. I'd be a big believer in uh, crossroads, places like that. I'd be a big believer in small groups. You know, if, if you go to crossroads, get on one of those go teams or get on one of the small group Bible studies. Other churches have other variations of that. Um, if you're downtown, there's tons of things like the, the Fridays on the Square. Um, you know, there's just so many opportunities to really deepen relationships with people and romance can come out of that as well and love. Uh, I just I just think that the computer draws us into its own reality and uh, we end up going down these paths that we get stuck in and we worry about whether this person's a, a real person or are they a Russian hacker, right? <laughs> well, you don't have to worry about that with your neighbor uh, if you get to know them over time. And you never know where love might come from. It could come from the third relationship that that neighbor knows. And you could say, well, who else do you know who might know somebody, right? So right. Uh, I think online dating uh, is fine for some people. I, I'm just not uh, expert in that at all. Uh, the other helpful hints are a little uh, m more positive. It's, it's just a reminder that friends are not a replacement for services or families. I see this mistake happen a lot. People think that they want to build a network so that they don't have to have services or supports. Or people want to build a network so their family can move to Florida and retire. I, I actually am a big proponent of families living as close as possible just because I think it's a good pattern. I think it's good things for people to be connected. I played rummy with my grandmother who's 96 on Sunday and my one-year-old son, her great-grandson, for his birthday was there. And I think that's beautiful that we live so close that we can spend that time and support each other. And Grandma doesn't know the rules of Romy anymore. You know, she used to know every card game under the sun, but she can't remember that. But because we're able to be here, we can support her in that instead of us being far away and not able to support her. Uh, she does have services to do things that she doesn't want her family to do. And that's totally cool too, but it's a blend. It's not an ownership of her life, you know. Um, so friends are, are there for love. You know, I always like um, this interesting quote from the Bible, which is, give to God what is God's and give to Caesar what is Caesar. I think friends and families are of God. 
and then I think services and supports are paid. Those are Caesars. And they don't necessarily have to cross over. The services should help support friends and family connections, but friends and families don't have to replace services, if that makes sense. Uh, you, you would just get yourself yeah. in trouble if you make a friend and then say, oh, by the way, I really need you because I need you to drive me everywhere. Or I really am talking to you because I, I need you to hang out with me when my staff calls in sick or something. You know, so it's just we, we, we have to figure out how to really be proper about those relationships in a good way that honors them both. Uh, the work is never done. I know, Jeremy, you and I were talking about this. Uh, you were telling this great story about your roommate. Yeah. And then you were telling me that he just got engaged, right? So right. We are like making a bet on when you're, you and he are not going to live together. <laughs> so <laughs> right. it's, it's awesome, right? But yeah. you, you know that it's temporary, and that means that the relationship building has to keep going on and on and on. It just can never end. Or you get into a point where you uh, aren't able to grow it because you relied on one person all along, right? Right. Um, the other thing is really interesting. Don't do it alone. This was a question I think Diane was asking is how do you help, how do you find it? You know, and this was a question related to kind of like what I just said. Somebody asked about what, what, what was the question was about online dating. Online dating is an alone experience. You're almost like you're on your own trying to find somebody, right? And right. what I'm more interested in is how do you get a gang of people together, do some awesome stuff, and draw even more people into your lives. And then you can start looking for relationships together. You can start inviting more people in, and all of a sudden, you're not alone in that effort, right? So invite people to go along. Hey, we're gonna try this yoga class. Why don't you come too? Uh, the person who said they took the garden class, they should be thinking about trying to make an invitation to at least one or two people every month to come along with them and join that group, right? Um, right. After that, create patterns and routines. Do it over and over again. Go to the garden for seven years. Have the potluck for four years. Our goal is to have the garden for 30 years and to have the potluck for 26 years. We think that that would grow a real deep culture in Bellevue around family and neighbors. Um, and I really am a big advocate for staying local. I think what's interesting about that is there's this potential for crossover. So if I stay local and build a local network, then I see my friends when I, they're going to church or they're at Kroger or we're both at the cafe or we show up at the park for fireworks night. There's just more potential for relationships to have these pop-up serendipitous kind of experiences, which are part of the deepening of relationships. If, if everybody on the call could think right now, take a minute and think about your very best friend and think about how long you've known that person. Maybe it's 30 years. Maybe it's six years. But maybe it it's started, 17 years like me and my roommate. Yeah, 17 years. And it started somewhere. And you say, wow, well, how did that grow? And it was because you guys were in and out of each other's lives and you accepted this invitation and then you ran into them there and they saw you here. And it just grew because you kept having these different experiences that built the relationship. It's almost as though you, Jeremy, and your roommate, you're two separate people, and then there's a third entity, which is called Jeremy and his roommate relationship, right? <laughs> so yeah. you're, you're focusing on the relationship and saying, what can I do that would build that third thing? Well, I would be forgiving when he messes up and, and leaves the, the beer spilled on the table, and he would forgive me or, when I... Or, or, and I'm going to use an example here, and I don't mean to embarrass him, but or when he accidentally changed the door shut on me that happened yeah. Monday night, and I was like, oh no, or no Sunday night, and I was like, oh geez, so I was outside yeah. for about 40 minutes, but, yeah, you know, and it was an accident, total accident, for all is forgiven, you know, yeah. it's all good. And you can you can joke about the time you were Fred Flintstone pounding on the door and yelling Wilma, and he can say, "Hey man, I thought you were bringing home a weird woman that night or something," you know. And you no, know, it just it it can become a memory, right? We can say that time you locked me out, you jerk. Oh, that's you know? great. At his wedding, you could actually say to his bride, "I just want to tell you, 
he has locked me out before. Make sure you have a key at all times, right? And then it becomes a great uh, a great memory instead of yeah. Yeah, so so yeah, good, exactly that kind of stuff. Uh, just remember that the heads up was that relationships don't happen on a webinar. They actually do happen in your neighborhood, and you're the one that's going to have to build them. I'm here to help. You all know I'm Tim at Starfire. You can get a hold of me. It's pretty easy. Uh, this is a Google Me list. This is down in your handouts. These are the people that I learn from. I um, just want to highlight that first one, social role valorization. Uh, we're bringing in an expert. Her name is Joe Mazzarelli. She learned under Wolf Wolfensberger. He's passed away. But Joe learned under Wolf Wolfensberger and she taught me a lot of this. So she'll be here talking about valued social roles and how to stand up against the devaluation that people with disabilities experience. That's September 5th, 6th, and 7th at Starfire. Uh, it's free to people with disabilities and their families. If it's somebody in the biz, like a, an employee or something, it's $100 for the whole training. And it's seriously one of the most important foundational trainings I've ever had. So I'd encourage everybody to try to, try to make it. Um, and then on down that list, you'll just see some 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 resources, the things you can look up, our our WordPress blog, and some uh, YouTube videos and stuff. Uh, the second resource I gave is just some simple acts, and these are things I've mostly kind of uh, mentioned already. But I just encourage y'all to get involved in your neighborhoods and make things happen in ways that haven't been done before. Uh, so I, I put that list together and. Um, at any rate, just check that out and uh, see what happens. Try something. Uh, that kind of wraps up my uh, part of this. We were supposed to go to 8.05, and with a couple questions, we got to 8.09. So I'm feeling like I'm pretty awesome time-wise, uh, which leaves yeah. us some time for questions if you guys have them. Yeah, uh, and uh, we want to thank you for sharing this important and often neglected topic with us. Uh, during the presentation, we did address several questions. Uh, there's still time now, uh, if you have any additional questions, uh, submit those through the question pane on your attendee control panel. We do have a couple here, uh, or I do have a couple here in front of me. Uh, my 15-year-old son has trouble making social plans and often ends up sitting in front of the computer. How much should I intercede to help make plans until others start to call him? Yeah, that is an awesome question. So there's a couple things going on here. One is, and this is kind of a cop-out, so I hope people don't really take this seriously, but people say, oh, that's a problem for all 15-year-olds, you know? Like, that's kind of true. Like, 15-year-olds are largely, at least it seems to me, enthralled with their devices. But what that actually discounts is the the real risk to people with disabilities and getting that isolated and the the sadness that it comes from watching your family members just suck into that world so here's what I'll say to that person um, I actually believe that the family is a legitimate social place to start I think that um, you as a family member should be saying how do we as a family become more socially connected don't focus on making your son be more socially connected. Start asking how do I, how does our family get socially connected? That's been our whole question. We all go to the potlucks. We all go to the garden, and then other people's families start coming too. And dads and moms talk to dads and moms, and kids talk to kids, and kids talk to dads and moms, and vice versa. So, I really think that um, don't feel guilty about making some family inroads into this question and saying, well, we as a family are going to invest in becoming pillars of this commu community. We're going to start the, the, the movie night in our front yard. As a family, we can host that. And he can pick out the movies, right? Let's do Star Wars or Indiana Jones or something. Um, just encourage you not to think that it has to be relationships just for him, that it could be relationships for your entire family. And I have a hunch that relationships for him will grow out of that. And he'll appreciate the diversity too, you know? There's last thing we want to do is turn this uh, friendship uh, concept into a checkbox forced thing that families haven't done well. But I would encourage you to let go of the narrative that he has to have friendships on his own with his peer group. I'm more interested in families working together on this. Okay. Uh... 
another one, uh, and actually, this is something that I deal with personally. Uh, I sometimes feel like I have to give 150% in a relationship, and it doesn't feel good. What can I do to change that? Yeah, well, that's what I like about projects, right? So um, the mistake that I've noticed, at least in my own life, around relationships is if I focus on trying to make a relationship happen, I end up really like putting a lot of pressure on both of us to you know, live into some sort of thing. And, and like I said, the, st the research shows that it's not about you and me, Jeremy, sitting down and drinking coffee and pouring our hearts out. That we actually go, grow closer together if we focus shoulder to shoulder. And we focus on how do we paint the playground or how do we uh, take the kids camping for Boy Scouts Day or how do we plant the garden or how do we create this mural on the park bench you know we do something together and what ends up happening is we delegate out tasks uh, would you please bring the ice water and I'll bring the sandwiches and would you get the word out on Facebook and then I'll go around the network and uh, neighbor neighborhood and, and hand out these these flyers so we all can do, we can assign different tasks, which give us each something to contribute to the project and ends up creating the magic and the connection of the project, of the teamwork, right, the camaraderie, which then creates an experience that creates memory. And memory is actually an artifact of relationship that time we did that thing together. And then we ended up creating part of the relationship without having to work on the relationship. We worked on the playground. Right. So right. I would just offer that make that little change of doing something. And, and remember, it's not your bright idea. You should be going home to your roommate and saying, hey, let's plan your bachelor party. Who else should we invite into this planning here? Right. And, and what do right. you want to do? It's not your idea. You don't take them to Vegas and have them get lost and whatever hangover happens, you know, but you're asking him, what does he want to do? Right. right. And, and building out a project out of that or something, you know? So, uh, yeah, I think that's a really great question. People mistakenly think it's about focusing on the relationship, but it's about focusing on the project and then letting the relationship build out of that. At least that's a little shortcut that helps take the pressure off and builds the relationship while we wait. Okay, uh, and finally, uh, transportation is a problem for me. I don't drive, and the bus isn't always convenient. How do I get out to meet others if I always have to rely on my parents to get me there? Oh, totally. So two things. Uh, well, f three things. One is uh, you're just you should rely on whatever transportation you can, you know, bus, Uber, whatever. But um, I would also that's why I say go local because I really want you to figure out how do I make transportation not an issue. What if I can't even leave my house? Can I still have relationships? There is an answer to that. It's a designed question that we would use our front yards and our living rooms, and we would have people figure out how we didn't go very far and we still built relationships. Um, it's a pretty specific question, so I'd have to see a neighborhood to think on it with people, um, and I'd have to know what the person's true limitations were. If it's just that I can't drive, well, there's lots of places to walk to. Or if I live in a super rural community, well, then we have a whole other set of issues we'll have to plan around. That is a really great question, though. All right, and with that, uh, we'll turn it over to Diane for the wrap-up. Okay, thank you, Tim, and thanks to everyone for attending today's webinar, Building Your Support Network. If you have any other questions, please email me at dburns at and I'll make sure to get them to Tim and get them answered for you. On behalf of the Spina Bifida Coalition of Cincinnati, the Starfire Council, our presenters, and the Hatton Foundation, we thank you for joining us. Now go create your future.